Okay, that's her code board. Roger. That's her uh, pass the transom. Roger. Hey, sir, are we good to start Atlanta? Van uh, deck, uh, that's us uh, getting ready to send uh, Atlanta overboard. Good copy. So for those of you who are just tuning in, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are currently launching our ROVs into the water for our next dive. You can see on deck that it is Atalanta, and our Hercules is already in the water, so Atalanta is falling right behind. This dive today will be serving the unnamed Guillot 12, right outside the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. This will be a 14-hour dive, and we are expected to go to a max depth of 2,264 meters. Okay, that's Atlanta free of the vessel. Okay, copy.
All right, now that the ROVs are in the water, we can go ahead and uh, start to facilitate more of our SPL. So, I'd like to go around and introduce ourselves. Just, uh, hold on a second there, Daniel. We're not at 50 yet, and we're going to have to hold there for a second. got to secure something on the porch here. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Van, uh, deck. Go ahead. Yeah, that's us all stopped here at five zero meters. This is an audio slate for dive H1959. UTC time is 23.36.30. Mark. Okay, back row, Daniel, we're all good here. You can carry on. All right, thanks for that. So, yep, I am your SPO host, uh, science communicator, uh, Daniel Price, and I am from uh, West Virginia University and Bryce Canyon National Park. We can go down a row here. Okay, hello, my name is Sarah. I'm uh, Sarah Vadashore. I'm the scientist for this watch, and I'm from Philadelphia, and I just graduated from Tumble University. Hi, everyone. I'm Leela. I am watch lead on this watch and science manager on the cruise, and, uh, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Yo, Brooklyn. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am Guadalupe Zapata. I go by Loopy. Um, 
I am the data logger for this expedition. I am an undergrad at Tuskegee University, but I am from Gaston, Alabama. There was a really big group of, or school of fish, right when we were mm -hmm. going down. On the top? Yeah. Look at these little fish. No, I wonder what they are. Piranhas. Really? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was, like a fish? Uh -huh. Where are piranhas, like, typically located? Aren't they mm. in, like, Brazil or yeah, something? Yeah, Amazon. Or, yeah. yeah. I believe. Those are some gnarly fish. So, question of the day for everyone. Question of the day. What's your favorite mode of transportation? Oh, that's a nice one. Hmm. I like that one. That's good. Hmm. I really like bikes. Bikes. That's what I was gonna Big say. Big on yeah. bikes. Oh. Hmm. I, I mean, there's all kinds of bikes. You can you can mountain bike. You can like speedy road bike. Did you, you turn that back on? Uh, so it might be this bike up mountains. I don't know. Bikes That's are very useful, but but then again, there are also skis. Skis are another <laughs> great mode of transportation. You can cross-country ski. You can mm -hmm. downhill ski, ski mountaineer. Mm. You know, why hike up a mountain and then walk all the way back down it? Mm. Yes, yeah. yes down it. I agree. Skiing is fun. I love skiing. Oh, no, I like scooters. That's her uh, pass the transom. Roger. Scooters, you said? Yeah. No, scooters are fine. That's all right. Hmm. I'm going to go with sailboat. Oh, oh yeah. That's yeah. Nice. That's pretty oh, good. of course. <laughs> oh, a team. Go for um, I think for me, if not bikes, I think subway. I like how far you can get. Mm -hmm. That's true. How fast. Mm -hmm. Do yeah, it's like a, a good, subway or train. Good public transportation system. Yes. Do they call it subway in Philly? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go ride the hoagie. <laughs> um, a lot of people just say like wow, SEPTA. Wow, fishies. SEPTA? Yeah, SEPTA. I forget what the what it stands for, yeah. but that's like the name of the of like the buses and the subways and regional rail. I always think it's interesting, like the different names for the mm -hmm. train systems, because yeah. like Boston mm -hmm. is the T. Right. DC, it's Metro. Uh huh. Right, Subway, Septa, Marta. In London, mm -hmm. it's the tube. The tube. Yeah. I forget what Chicago's is. I I've never been on a train, but Brian was telling me uh. that being in Rhode Island, he was like, you can really just take the train and go to New York if you wanted to for like yeah. a weekend. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you yeah. can. So I was like, hmm. Yeah. That'd be fun. You should do that. You should absolutely do that. It's, it's a worthwhile. And if you book your, if you're able to book a ticket in advance, it's like super cheap. It's cheaper, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, my family uh, lives in Philly as well, and they always take the train from Philly to D.C., where mm -hmm. I live nearby, and we pick them up. So easy. Definitely will be looking into that. Mm -hmm. I'd say my favorite mode of transportation is uh, a little out of this world, uh, a spaceship. A spaceship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take you anywhere. Speaking from experience. I was going to say, are you trying to plug yourself there? Only in my dreams. <laughs> but it did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> Re-entry wasn't the most fun. So. You know, I like how none of us said ships. I said uh, sailboat. sailboat. <laughs> well, that's not a ship. I wouldn't say that a ship is my favorite mode of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, uh, good research platform. But yeah. <laughs> like bicycles. Airplanes yeah. and cars. And skis. <laughs> <laughs> skis. I like, well, Scooters. I yeah. Roller skates? Skateboard? Wakeboard. Mm. 
kite surfing, <laughs> zip lining, <laughs> Katie, skydiving. Katie was talking about how um, one of the the lead SEL. Well, train is good. About how yeah. she, how a lot of her students made a video about like alternative modes of transportation. Aww. Um you know, in a climate friendly way. Yeah. And they were like, why don't you surf to work? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, All right, yeah, sure. That's a, we'll put that one in there. <laughs> I like their thinking. <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. I was Ooh. like, that'd be a nice one way ride. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I think we just went through a siphonophore. Or there's a couple going by. Oh, wow. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. Like jellies, Are we almost. Yeah, it's hard to see actually really long protrusions, whatever they are. Do we, do we do introductions yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did the back row. You the should back go. row, not the front. You can, you can start, start it off. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Cheyenne Waters. I'm the navigator. And I also wanted to say hi to Kaylin and Ollie. <gasps> Yay. You got friend, friends or family watching? Uh, my sister oh. and my aunt's dog. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Hi, Cheyenne's sister. <laughs> yeah. And dog. Is the any, waters. Also, is there any chance that we could get the Atalanta cam a little bit downwards? Sorry I always ask for that, but I feel like we see cool things. Yay, thank you. Of course. Mike, do you want to introduce nice. yourself? Michael, it's your turn. <laughs> He's For busy what? working. Intros. Intros. Who are you? Michael Hannaford, the Hercules pilot today. <laughs> Perfect. <coughs> I should have made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before our watch. <laughs> I like how that's <laughs> Why? response to intros. <laughs> Why? I don't know. That's kind of the vibe right now. Is peanut butter and jelly? Yep. But they don't have grape jelly. They only have strawberry and then some like. I apple. love strawberry. Oh. Boy, <laughs> you don't like grape. Yeah. <laughs> Which do you like better, jelly or jam? Jam. Yeah, I think jam, jam. is better. Uh, I like the fruit pieces. Try and uh, get another. I never. I don't think I've had jam. I've only had jelly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. For the longest, I didn't even eat jelly, so. <laughs> I just started. I tell y'all, I'm making progress. <laughs> you are, you <laughs> are. I'm making progress. Expanding your palate. So yeah. proud. That's great. Ooh. What about that. creamy or crunchy peanut butter? Oh, crunchy. 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 Oh, yes, Leela. Yes, <laughs> we'll have another butter. crunchy person. For sure. <laughs> creamy, I'm sorry. Oh, no. no. I'm sorry. It's like the, are the more natural brands the crunchy only? Yeah. Are they crunchy only or like? Usually got both. Okay. Most yeah. brands usually have both. Okay. I want to start getting into natural peanut butter. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. So I, just I like the crunchy. Mm. Sorry for anybody texture. with a peanut allergy. <laughs> Which is another question. Uh, what are your alternatives to peanut butter? Sunflower, almond butter. Almond. Almond butter is pretty good. So good. I haven't tried it. I've tried a cinnamon toast crunch peanut butter spread or so. Mm. That was it was pretty mm. good, not too bad. Sounds interesting. Have you guys ever tried sunflower butter? No, yeah, I have. Really it really sounds really good. It's very good. nutty. I like that. Not to be in the mood for it, but it's good. And it it's good for people who don't who have a nut allergy because mm. there's mm -hmm. a seed. You get a lot of good uh, vitamins and minerals in sunflower seeds. Got a lot of omega threes. I believe. Oh, Chicago's the L, right? I couldn't remember. Oh, look at elevated it. train. A Tina four. Tina four. Really oh, yeah. long one. Wow. We oh, we haven't seen many jelly. of those. Yeah, I think we saw one like once or twice, but really, really fast. But so oxygen's starting to climb again, but just now at around like 250 meters, we were at almost zero percent oxygen Whoa. saturation. Really. Very low. Wow. Yes, yeah, so that's the oxygen that's minimum zone wild. that we were going through. Yeah. So with low oxygen saturation in the deep water, how do many um, organisms get their oxygen intake, especially for like fishes and sharks? Uh, there are organisms that withstand low oxygen temperatures. Some mm. in some areas are anoxic or anaerobic. Sorry, uh, like microbes and stuff that don't need oxygen for respiration. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, now it's climbing again, though. Yeah. So now it'll it'll be oxygen higher. fluctuates. Yeah, there's kind of predictable um, patterns in oxygen as you descend. Hey Daniel, is the chat up and running? It is. Yes. Does it ask them to refresh? Yeah. I said I was about to tell my mom the other day, <laughs> and I still don't think she asked the question. <laughs> yep, it says available for questions right now. So we're about an hour and ten minutes to oh, the wow. bottom. This is a bit deeper dive. We're going down to um, about 22, 2300 meters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we don't have like, uh, we don't have clear one, two, three, four, five waypoints uh, for this dive. We kind oh, of are really? just following right. this feature up. Yeah. Um, yeah, we tried to, on the seamount, pick what we thought would be Cool. Most interesting within the dr the headings, the bearings that we're able to go, uh, which in marginal weather is currently uh -huh. kind of northeast. So sorry, guys. I fat fingered that. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it's okay. But huh? All right. So of all the northeast heading tracks we could find on the seamount. This was one that had potentially slightly steeper slopes, uh, more so near the top, um, and was within sort of that depth range where we've been seeing more interesting bio. I think we're starting a bit yeah. deeper, yeah. but it's been kind of between 2,000, and really between 1,800 and, uh, and shallower that we've, we've seen more coral on our previous dives so or more more biodiversity and higher density so we'll see what we see and uh see what what we start off over but if we see anything interesting we want to follow it we can do that yep but who knows what we'll see Yep. You never know. Well, just shark. like, <laughs> well, just like our last watch, we saw that really, really, really cool jellyfish. Oh yeah. Do we? Do you want to give an update on more information yeah. about it? It was sent to um, to Dougal Lindsay, is a taxonomist of these of jellies. Shout out. And um, it's that is an undescribed species that has only been seen one other time, eight years or so ago uh, by Okeanos. And we saw it much deeper than that one had been seen. And uh, yeah, so that's super interesting, and valuable footage that we got of a very rarely, almost never sighted organism. Um, yeah. Super exciting. It was awesome. Yeah, you said it was the uh, oh. order Narcomendusae and mm -hmm. within the genus Bathychorus, I believe. That was spectacular. That made my day. Yeah, yeah that, that was that awesome. That made my cruise. I don't need to see anything else. Yeah. I'm good. It makes oh, that oh, you don't want to see any more sea sea. I don't. Lines? I said I don't need. <laughs> so you don't need to see a whale shark anymore. I said I don't need. No, no, we need to see a whale shark. Yeah, no, we need to see a whale shark. Technically, one was already seen, so, I mean... Everybody has to see a whale shark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to see it with our own eyes. Um. We must manifest the whale shark. Mm. Uh... Yeah, that computer's top side won't be able to con con to to talk to the one that's down there unless it's on. Is that is still cam on? I didn't even Should check. Should be. I'll just confirm. Yeah. Didn't even check. Yep. Uh, yep, we're good. Yeah. Thank you. 
Oh. So for those of you at home, I was able to refresh the page and open up uh, our website for avail availability for questions. Uh, just let us know if you still see it on our website, and if it doesn't, we'll try and fix oh. it here. Oh yeah, here it is. Sorry, yeah, I'm and I'm reading about it, and it's actually a uh, it's actually the Medusa stage of a hydrozoan. <gasps> so it's not Whoa. a siphozoan like no. uh, true jellies. Yeah, it's not a it's jelly um, even. So yeah, hydrozoans are really interesting because they have both polyp and medusa phases in their life cycles. And some some spend more time in the polyp phase, some more in the medusa phase. Um, yeah, so this is the medusa morph uh, of a hydrozoan. Oh, wow. Huh. It seems like That's this one really spends cool. most of its time as a, as as a, medusa. a medusa. Yeah. Oh, squid. Oh, man, I didn't see it again. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So I'm assuming it's never been seen in its polyp phase. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, or they do has, know they don't some about at least the orders reproductive. Yeah. Um, uh, OK cycle. That's really cool. Oh, and the one that they found eight years ago had four of those had protections. Four. I know, and it felt like this one should have had four, you know, but it looked so not uneven. But I, I wonder know. if it was just missing one. Maybe. I Hard don't to know. say. Yeah. But that was, yeah, that like made my life. <laughs> It was really cool. Yeah, but even like like these other ones in the same order, so like this one only has three. This one only has three. Oh, really? Yeah, look at these. Like that. So I don't. Or is it that another picture of that one on the right that has four? Oh, it's you know. Back. Okay. How much of a problem are barnacles on boats when you're sailing? Um. Yeah, actually, it's kind of a big problem because if you're racing and you want to go fast, you have to clean um, the bottom of your boat, and it makes a big difference. Um, not just barnacles, too, like algae off of it. So we'll go and swim under the boats and like try to clean them best as possible as often as we can to make sure that it's, it's nice and smooth and goes fast. Also, barnacles are really sharp. So sharp. They oh are very gosh. sharp. Yeah, they so hurt. I've gotten so many barnacle cuts. Oh my gosh. And they're uncomfortable to look at, too. At least for me. <laughs> Processing oysters and barnacles. Like Ouch. <laughs> 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 yeah, I made the mistake of going to a beach once, not wearing uh, any uh, shoes or foot protection when I'm walking near oysters, and I got a nasty cut on my big toe. Oh no. So. Uh, personal safety announcement, whenever walking on the beach, make sure you have uh, foot protection. Yeah, and the, all the microbes in, in like sharp ocean organisms, I feel like are extra nasty. When you're scuba diving on a coral reef and you scrape, scrape yourself on coral, mm -hmm. that gets real nice and infected. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to wear a wetsuit just to not have to deal with that. <laughs> yep, that's no bueno. That's also why we wear gloves in our uh, wet lab whenever we're handling samples, because some of them have uh, sharp or piercing elements to them, like sponges or corals. So yeah, you got to be careful with that. Those will pierce right through our latex gloves. <laughs> the gloves are, are good for uh, keeping us from contaminating one sample with another. Uh, a lot of that ends up being processed uh, gen genetically, sequenced.
Did you guys hear about the shipment of spices that fell into the ocean? Oh. Huge waste of time. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I thought it was going to be something soup related. <laughs> Man, I like that that joke could be repurposed for anything. It could be like, fell out of the back of a truck. Yeah, it right. Like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> lost on delivery. <laughs> Flexible. Like flexibility. Mm -hmm, it's good. Because I never have a joke when people ask me to tell one. I can remember that now. <laughs> about uh, yeah, I'm, like, I'm real bad at jokes. That's why I never tell any. <laughs> There's nothing in there. Sorry, guys. We all bring different talents. So, where's the best place to punch a shark? Oh. oh. The best so place to punch a shark? Um, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, That's a great question. What is it? In the sea. In, in the, the sea. sea. I don't get it. Oh. <laughs> All the, it was like she there's a lot know. of debate over whether where the best place to punch a shark is personally i think it's the sea got it got it this one took I me a second to understand but the oceans are comprised of minimally carbonated salt water therefore the earth is flat <laughs> Get it. Uh -huh. like, i was like oh, i don't i had to read on, that like twice the earth, you know flat really water oh. <laughs> The That's earth is in fact round, but that water, it's yeah, it's pretty crunchy. Yeah. All right, so we have some more questions coming in. So we point those up here. Okay, so where are we heading right now? In what part of the vast Pacific Ocean are we in? Well, we are on a very descriptively named Sea Mount. Uh, Guillot, to be more specific, because it has a flat top. Guillot number 12. Uh, within the exclusive economic zone of the United States, so within those 200 nautical miles outside of uh, U.S. territories. And we are outside, though, of the Pacific Remote Islands uh, National Marine Monument, as uh, or Marine National Monument, as as uh, Megan was clarifying. Um, and I don't know exactly now how far north we are of of Palmyra Atoll, but we were, I don't know, maybe we're like 100, 170 nautical miles or something north, something around there. Um, so really far out there, and that's uh, mm -hmm. more than three days steam also, uh, sort of south-ish word of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So so really far out there, and we're currently on the southern slope or flank of guillot number 12. Yeah, this uh, is as far south as we've been yeah. so far, mm -hmm. about 100 it's miles It's very, south very, very well, humid. <laughs> what was that, Megan? About 100 miles south? We're about 100 miles, um, actually kind of a little north northeast now from Kingman Reef. Okay. Um, we've mm. come quite a bit we've east come a ways. and south from where we were diving before. I can think about, I don't know, I always think Ooh. about describing it like you're going to drive a giant circle, a big donut around these places. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of been up in the northwestern corner of that donut. And then the last two days just came right across the north, like 12 o'clock, it was o'clock. And now we're kind of like one o'clock. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Huh. But yeah, about 800 miles from Honolulu. Mm -hmm. If you want to look us up on a map, we're at about seven point seven degrees north and one sixty two degrees west. 
If you're watching on the quad view, there's also a map embedded there to show you where we are. Yeah, and like in a, in a bigger context, I mean, these islands and atolls are, are really part of um, Micronesia and Micronesian history. So we are the closest country to us, if you don't count the U.S. that we're in U.S. waters, is the, the nation of Kiribati. Uh, the wind's increasing mm -hmm. a lot. We should be fine, though, but public safety announcement, it's raining really hard outside and very windy. Uh -oh. So be aware. Thanks. Stay hunkered down in the van, nobody <laughs> leave. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's basically slipping. what the bridge says. <laughs> <laughs> it's always so jarring, you know, you're in this dark room and you walk out and you're either like, oh my god, I'm blinded, it's so bright. And or, it's humid. Or you're like, it's nighttime? <laughs> or, yeah, my, right, you never know what you're going to My glasses fog up, like, whoa, immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or it's pouring. It's weird not, like, we don't hear the rain, or I've no. never noticed the rain in this in this in the in the vans it's funny because this is like a tin thing yeah. isn't it but it's painted over but it's like theoretically if it was tin roofed it would be really loud i think it's the air conditioner yeah, yeah i can so hear loud. it i can hear it a lot in you can yeah. hear it in there oh, yeah, totally. oh okay then it's just uh the other white noise there's a live feed right outside oh well that doesn't really i don't know i feel like even that camera doesn't do how hard it can rain justice <laughs> But Sometimes. certainly captures the waves. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I always thought mysterious was how you could see in the distance that all the rain is just uh, splashing onto the surface of the water and kind of bouncing up. And it makes the line between the sky and the ocean really hazy. And that's just, I don't know, it's an interesting feeling to look at that. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah. It's a little creepy. Feeling especially, feeling especially lucky right now because I know there's fires in Nova Scotia and it's kind of making everything mm. smoky, but we're all the way out here with no smoke horizon. <laughs> and for those of you wondering, yes, our coffee pots are safe and sound and secured. We will not be having <laughs> any spilling on this trip. Our coffee pots in general. Glad someone's worried about our <laughs> caffeine intake. Step on, secure the coffee. <laughs> yeah, we haven't had any days yet where everything goes flying. Where yeah. like the chairs are flying across the room. <laughs> <laughs> so. Have you heard about our next expedition to British Columbia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Tune be in. Be a beautiful time. Yep. We're no. excited. That would be a seafloor mapping expedition, right? No. Up next immediately is a seafloor mapping expedition on the way up there, yep. And then an ROV exploration um, expedition with Ocean Networks Canada. Our nice. Partners up there. I heard you all talked about hydrophones earlier. That is a place where there are a lot of underwater microphones or oh. microphones on the seafloor. Um, so cool. Listening to everything from like low frequency tectonic sounds to seafloor sound. Um, yeah, and all those recordings are available. Anybody can search the Ocean Networks Canada website and listen to the deep sea. I really love when people make oh. art using that. It's very cool. Using the, the hydrophone recordings? Yeah. Are like there any people... like electronic deep sea playlists? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but I mean like some people like visualize the sound. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I've and seen it before. Yeah, I've also heard artists come out and do like yeah, immersive soundscapes of yeah. all the sounds on a ship. Very cool. Yep. So Cheyenne, how long is it until we reach the bottom? And how fast are we descending? <laughs> so no we're, right now we're descending about <laughs> 26 meters go back per up. minute. And we have about mm -hmm. 38 go minutes up. to go. <laughs> 31. Um, <laughs> oh, 28. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> We're descending 28 meters per minute and That's we have so about 35 minutes to go. Yeah. Nice, thank you for that. All right, so it looks like that's supposed to be Cam Amid. Um, let me check on it. <laughs> It's 
sorry, we were just laughing at a joke that we can't say over SPL. <laughs> But here's a joke we can laugh at. So somebody wrote in, uh, how do you make a whale float? Like, how do you make um, a whale float? Um, um, I don't know. I don't know, maybe make a... Make the water salty? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a ballast tank, a balloon. What nope. is it? Uh, to make a, a whale float, you need root beer, ice cream, a mug, and a whale. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Keys on windows right now without the whale. Oh my gosh, I haven't had a root beer float in so long. I don't think I've had a root beer float since I was like seven years old. Okay, well. Okay, you're due for one. I don't think I ever had a root beer float. Oh, float. loopy. Oh, uh, I, I didn't drink root beer for the longest. <laughs> well, it's really good with like Coke too, but. And like cream soda and a root, like a float. That's oh. also good. And orange cream soda. Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. I'm ready for a Sunday already. Ice cream. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <clears throat> I'm still thinking about, uh, Levo, what you said last watch, that um, shaved ice, green tea ice cream. Oh, we're oh, getting it. I can't geez. wait. Yeah. I can't wait to have a whole field trip over there. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii might be pricey, but um, I'm fine spending it on food. It's fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm you telling you, the moment I landed and I went to that mall to find food and they had raisin canes, I <laughs> I was in heaven. <laughs> they actually had raisin canes? Yes. Wow. What are raisin canes? It's kind of like a, I want to say like a chicken tenders place. It's like Popeyes. Yeah. yeah. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> right? Really? Yeah, Have it's like Popeyes? Popeyes, but not Cajun. I've actually never had Popeyes, no. Oh. Either I'm surrounded by Popeyes in Brooklyn. I've never had it, though. That's upsetting. Yeah. 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 Well, it's kind of like that. It's just like chicken tenders and mm -hmm. chicken. But they all do the breading different and the spices. Yeah. Their sauce is really good, though. The cane sauce? I yes. think it's okay. Honestly. I like their toast. <laughs> mm. Can't go wrong with toast. Yeah. I always get extra toast instead of like coleslaw because I don't eat coleslaw. Mm. So when we get back to Hawaii, everybody has to try a spam isubi. Oh, I've had one. Yeah, it's spam pretty good. Isubi. Do they have other variations? What is that? There are. There's like chicken katsu isubi. Yeah. Well, yeah. You got, but spam isubi is like the classic Hawaiian what thing. Is, yeah, but what I don't. Is yeah. I don't because eat pork. <laughs> so. so. Fair enough. <laughs> they have other options that are similar. Well, it's yeah. good. They sell them at the uh, 7-Elevens for mm. like a dollar fifty. Yeah. Or less. <laughs> pretty good. Little snack. So during World War II, Ooh. there was a little bit, they had a hard time getting food to Hawaii, so they spent a lot, they sent a lot of spam, and they made like a spam sushi, so it's like spam, rice, and seaweed, and it's really good. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a very, it sounds weird, but it's really good. It's, it's a spam very classic Hawaiian thing. Yeah, musubi is a Japanese um, kind of like snack thing. It's kind of like a street food, I think. Um, and Hawaii has a lot of Japanese influence from immigration, which, yeah, hmm. long history there. <laughs> I feel like we were getting so close and now only 15 minutes have passed. Yeah. <laughs> I know, the first 30 minutes went by super quick and now it's just like... Uh, it's like, show us something! <laughs> do do do. Well, shark. Well, shark. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep thinking about how like wild it would be if just like a huge whale came by. But like, I know that's not gonna happen. It's not whale season. Mm -hmm. So. That's exactly what we said before the sperm whale showed up. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I literally just explained why we would probably never see a whale. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, it. So it. crazy. Oh, cue it. Yeah. So I think you need to explain why we won't see a whale. Yeah, yet. Megan, go right yeah. ahead. Explain. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that is well, a question. Um, I take nothing for granted, you know, what the ocean decides to show us. Up to it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of animals that do see in the spectrums of light that we carry and that hear in the frequencies of sound that the robot makes um, 
you know, there's lots of studies. We do know that there are many different types of animals that do avoid ROVs. So there is some bias in kind of what we see on the seafloor and what we don't. Um, you know, I think about like, if you have grown up to be a, you know, many decade old animal in the seafloor, you don't usually do that by making silly, reckless choices. You do that by being cautious and being able to sense your environment. And when like a thing as big as a minivan that's loud and bright and, you know, come vibrating, comes like trucking through your environment, you might want to stand off a little ways. And so, yeah, my explanation has always been just that we're like a little too weird probably <laughs> for a whale yeah. to be like, let me swim right up to that where, where you can see it. Um, but then one, one fateful day in the Gulf of Mexico, a teenage boy sperm whale decided to prove us wrong there and spent 22 minutes circling the ROV, met us in the midwater, um, just like this, and uh, never touched the ROV, never bumped it, just circled and circled and circled around, you know, kind of looking underneath, above, side and side, in front of the herc, behind herc, and um, we got the incredible video that you can see on Nautilus Live. So cool. Mm -hmm. Man. That's one of my favorite videos to show on our um, uh, web interactions. Oh, yeah. But being bright and noisy isn't all bad because we do, the ship uh, with all its lights does attract the oceanic white tip sharks and squid and stuff at night. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fun to see the whole, like a whole food chain happening. Yeah. The mahi mahi. Food web. Yeah, the squid, and then the mahi-mahi, and then the oceanic white tips. Real cool. Ooh, look at this siphonophore <clears throat> on Atlanticam. Oh, yeah, it's gone. Ah, <laughs> oh, so here's an interesting question. Uh, somebody from Montreal, Quebec, uh, welcome aboard. They asked, do we have names for each watch team? And that's what I never thought about. We should, uh, oh, we should we have a name have for our team. <laughs> Usually, you know, the name comes to the team. You just like yeah. naturally make one as you go. I haven't, I we haven't, haven't had nothing has come moments. to me yet oh, oh, for this watch. I but think maybe one we can. Uh, it's like a nickname. You can't just be like, "We're gonna be this." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can keep it in the back of our yeah. minds. Yeah. Maybe the audience can help. Yes, maybe the audience can help. There's, I think it might be the the 8 to 12 watch that has a nickname, but I don't know. Maybe that can be a question that everyone gets asked today. Well, yeah. We have been kind of the unlucky watch. I don't think yeah, that at all. That's not not cool. true. I don't know. We have not had much blue water. Hey, that we jelly have pretty seen lucky. some really cool communities on we our We saw watch. that jelly. We that was a good one. Like like well, that's not. That's <laughs> I think that's about setting well, your expectations. Good. I think we're yeah. more than the <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of patience. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were delayed an hour going in during our watch is a cool uh, thing. I think we are the lucky watch. There you go. We had a rough start, but then we've got lots of bottom time lately. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about manifesting good vibes. <laughs> yeah, it's, I know it's kind of common to have issues in this region, right? Oh, well, yeah, or anytime between, like, you're at weather, sea for this yeah. long, you're bound to be in a couple systems. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, I think one of the things that's amazing, even when the weather's up, right, is that these are, these waves and these storms are generated thousands of miles away yeah. from where we are yeah. right now. And yeah. It's just a matter of when they when they roll across, you know. If you're used to being near a shoreline, there's plenty of things to hide behind or an island chain. Mm -hmm. But out here, you know, we're feeling the influence of there's a massive storm system south of us. You know, our thoughts are with everybody in Guam, that huge storm typhoon yeah. that went through last week. Um, you know, not in this area, but areas further south would have gotten huge swell from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is just a privilege to be out here, which is one of the things that I am starting to, I'm trying to be aware of. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And if you at home are also interested in having opportunities such as this, uh, we have many opportunities to join the Nautilus team. So if you go to our website, you can scroll to the top of the page in the About section. You see Employment Opportunities. You can also see on there the uh, Join tab. 
We have opportunities ranging from ocean science and engineering internships to our science communication fellowship, which is where I am right now. And we have opportunities for people ranging from community college, undergraduate and graduate students. We also have opportunities for scientists to be on board and ashore, as well as uh, people who work for our crew. That includes people ranging from engineers, navigators, cooks, uh, and everybody else in between. We take talent from all places and all around the world to help us in our journey of ocean exploration. So that begs the question, how did everybody get here? Mm. That's also another great question. Would you, you like to talk about how you got here, yeah, Cheyenne? Yeah, you start, Cheyenne. Um, well, I'm a bit weird. Um, I go to the Coast Guard Academy, and we have to work Ooh. during the summer. Oh, what so is that? Ooh. Not to cut you off, but yeah. that was interesting. That was interesting. Um, Come on. So this is just an internship that I can, that's offered through the Coast Guard Academy. Um, and I am the navigation intern, so I help direct the ship moves. Um, and next, the second part of the summer, I'm going to be on a cutter in Honolulu, so that'll be fun. That sounds like an yeah. awesome job, an awesome pathway Go to get Guard. here. It's a good. <laughs> if you're in high school and you like the water, I would look up the Coast Guard Academy. Yeah. Uh, Loopy, do you want to go next? We want to do a little L. Sure. Um, so I um, joined a club at Tuskegee University called Ocean Exploration, and I went on a field trip to southern Mississippi um, and just got behind the scenes of, like, an aquarium and stuff and just kind of, like, networked with ocean science people. And um, so, yeah, I figured this is something I was really, like, interested in and would like to explore more into. So they told me about the internship opportunities and stuff, so I applied, and this is one of the internships. It's actually a three-part internship, so this is the first part, is being here at sea with Nautilus. And then after here, I will go to Rhode Island, and um, I believe I'll be conducting more, like, research there and stuff. And then after that, we all, all the interns will meet. Um, in Mississippi, where the headquarters are at, and um, kind of present our work that we did um, over the summer and stuff. So, really looking um, forward to this summer. Um, it's really exciting so far <laughs> being out here. Um, so, just really looking forward to what Rhode Island has to offer, and then Mississippi. So, yeah. Woohoo! We're so excited you're here. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, I. This is Leela. <laughs> I, six years ago, was a senior uh, marine science student at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, which has a wonderful marine science program that I loved. Uh, and I was looking for. I had that year, I had never really thought about the deep sea much before. I had been more of a shallow water invertebrate um, researcher. And and then I had a, a, a seminar senior year where we uh, just different people each week um, brought in different papers about the deep sea, deep sea related papers. And we discussed them. And, and I realized like, oh man, deep sea is really cool. Why did we not learn about this earlier? Why is there not a whole class dedicated to this? So awesome. And so I was looking for uh, ways to, to jobs where I might be able to explore the deep sea or, or do deep sea research and came across the same, well, a different version of the internship that um, Loopy is doing. Uh, and I was the ocean science intern for one of Nautilus's expeditions uh, in the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument uh, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And then ever since then, I kept coming back. I came back for a few years as a science manager in training, and then now a couple years as science manager. And I, I also came out on Nautilus uh, twice for my own um, kind of in combination with that 
for my own research uh, while I was a graduate student at Oregon State University. And, uh, and yeah, just finished my master's and now I'm here working more often as, social, as a science manager. Woohoo! Congrats on your master's. Thank you. Yes. Um, and success story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine isn't as lengthy as that, but basically in college, I was in an evolutionary um, phylogenetics and genomics lab, and it was more medicine-based, and I didn't, I didn't really vibe with that, but it was really cool research. It just wasn't for me, but it kind of put me in the right direction. So I went in my university, and I was like, all right, who is labs open? And one of the only deep sea labs in the Philadelphia area, um, the PI was like, yeah, you can come on over. And I didn't really think about marine science, like, at all before, um, like, my, I guess, junior, the summer before my junior year of college. And, yeah, I was kind of, like, I kind of realized, whoa, there's so many new things, so many different things compared to terrestrial uh, ecosystems and even shallow water ecosystems. And I was really interested, so I just kept with it. And um, eventually my PI just like pulled me over one day like the day before spring break and he was like do you have five minutes to talk and I was really worried but then mm -hmm. he just said that Nautilus had an opening and um, that's why I'm here that's awesome yeah great to have you well thanks yeah. yep love to have everybody aboard yes. and so me I came aboard the ship as a science communication fellow and my pathway was very interesting so Growing up, I always loved science and uh, many aspects of it, uh, but I was especially a big uh, space geek growing up. I loved, that's why I said I loved spaceships earlier. But I also had a big fascination for the ocean because it's just such a, it takes up so much of Earth. And yet to think that we are the only planet that we know of in the universe that has a world mostly covered in a deep ocean of liquid water and there's so much life in there. It's absolutely mind blowing, and there's so much room for discovery. Like I would visit the beach growing up, as well as aquariums, and just seeing all the different sea creatures just blew my mind. Especially jellyfish. That's where I was so happy to see a jellyfish last watch. And so, yeah, uh, always having that as some of my one of my broader interests uh, kind of plays on later. But when I was in school, I was really into studying science and math. And I went on to college at West Virginia University, where I got my Bachelor of Science in Geology. Uh, finding that I really love being outdoors, but also loved uh, being in science and doing that in any environment. Originally, I was uh, majoring in aerospace engineering, Whoa. but I figured that geology, that was my way to go. So I switched my sophomore year, and uh, I've taken uh, I've taken that degree in done so many things with it. Uh, I had an internship in college where I was originally set to go to Greenland uh, to do field work, but I was instead out in Colorado, Montana, even got to do a little trip to Yellowstone. And after I graduated, I uh, applied for a program called Scientists in Parks. And that's something that if you're also interested in opportunities, they are currently having applications open till June 11th. Uh, this is a program that places students uh, who study uh, STEM subjects in college into national parks around the country for whatever STEM projects they need. So I applied and got a position at Bryce Canyon National Park in southern Utah where I was an interpreter assistant and I essentially did the job of a park ranger and I was going around and talking to people from all around the world about the geology and history of our park. It's an absolutely fascinating place. They have these giant orange rock spires to call it hoodoos and they had the biggest concentration of them anywhere in the world in that one spot. So, yeah, being there, uh, I was there all of last winter and during all the snow that we had. And uh, that job and that uh, position I was in gave me a lot of the skills and really uh, woken in me a passion for science communication that, um, that when I came across the opportunity for Nautilus, it just felt like fit right in. I already had an interest in uh, ocean science. I had a passion for science communication and I was just looking to explore the world and take, to, uh, use my degree to take me anywhere.
So yeah, I feel like it's one of those pathways where you don't necessarily have to go where you think you have to go. Just uh, leave your doors open to any opportunities that come your way. Such good advice. We are 14 minutes from the bottom. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay. Final countdown. So close. My ear is already feeling the wrath of these headphones. <laughs> <laughs> At least on. it's just on one ear. If it was both, that would be tough. That would be tough. Some people want to call us the whale shark watch. No whale shark watch? Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> Manifest the whale shark. That's cute. Okay, so people who were on watch a few days ago saw us uh, pick up those uh, uh, white carbonate rocks. And we were able to determine that they are of a uh, calcium carbonate origin, but we are not sh sure exactly the, uh, the genesis of those rocks. So one of our scientists on board, uh, he suspects that after he looked under the microscope, they could be of um, a foraminifera origin. And these are tiny microscopic organisms that live in water that build these tiny calcium carbonate shells around them. And sometimes they accumulate so much that they form these really gritty rocks at times. And they can form the rock limestone. We find that in many places. And as a geologist, uh, we study those quite often, and it's an entire field of study because you can look at the density of foraminifera in um, rocks and the fossil record, and you can determine the uh, uh, diversity and abundance of life at one point in time and in Earth's history, and also the amount of oxygen that's present because of how much uh, of the isotopes of oxygen we find within the foraminifera. So they are. Uh, they are very key and many, uh, I believe it's called biostratigraphy studies. <laughs> and yeah, they are a very important part of the ocean ecosystem and also the uh, rock cycle of Earth as well. Totally. Lots of folks call really them paleo-oceanographers cool. that work on that. You can study the ooze mm -hmm. on the seafloor. Often by taking um, cores of it, so that you yeah. could actually look back in time, similar to how those rocks, you know, would have shallow, shallow deposits and deeper, older deposits. Right. So remember earlier when Shannon was talking, we saw something that looked like had long tentacles like come across the screen. What do we think that was? We remember. Did not see it. Uh, when? It was like around ten minutes ago, maybe. Oh. Um. Yeah. Really, could have been anything. Could have been a squid. Could have been a jelly. Could have been a hydrozoa, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is really. Yeah. It's um, one of those funny times where like tentacles don't help you yeah. make the ID because so many creatures that live in the midwater have adapted some kind of elongate body part exactly. to help them stay suspended. I know I just kinda saw it roll by and yeah. I don't I don't think it was like a pelagic crab, but you know, all the things we're listing have long long dingly bits. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's tough in the midwater. Mm -hmm. But We'll see cool glimpses of things. <laughs> I don't know that he's online, but this feels like a good time to shout out Dr. Duval Lindsay, who is an expert in pelagic gelatinous creatures. And he yeah. helped, he's the person who helped us make the ID on the um, jellyfish yeah. before. So, you know, it's that super awesome that there are experts that know this stuff, even if they're not us. It would be impossible for 10 people in the van to be experts on everything. So we really rely on our team. And um, yeah, Dr. Lindsay came through super clutch for us. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, and yeah, more about that jelly looking thing. It's actually a hydrozoan in its um, medusa phase. And it's part of the, I forget the order, Narco but. Narcomedusa. Nar Narcomedusa. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the genus is Bathychorus. Mm -hmm. So really cool. Only seen once before at a much shallower depth, right? Was it? Yeah, shallower. I don't, I don't know exactly what depth that was. Yeah, at a much shallower depth. So really cool. But yeah, another. And it also had four of those weird angular tentacles, and we saw one with yeah. three. Yeah, and, and I looked at I looked at the video on it our highlights again, and there's symmetrical. It looks three. like it wouldn't have had a fourth, but who I knows? Know. Maybe it did at one point. And lost Maybe. it. Yep. And even then, we don't know why those tentacles look like that. <laughs> um, there's guesses, but. A lot of these organisms, we don't know why they have certain adaptations. We can make guesses based off of what we already know, but things are a lot different at these depths. Yeah, our expert ID that we think that animal um, is actually a predator of other jellyfish and pelagic sea cucumbers. Mm. And so, um, you know, we're waiting to waiting to learn more from Dr. Lindsay, but I, I would wonder if those were uh, kind of like helping to contain prey. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think I read that in that order they can curl those tentacles towards mm. their mouths. Oh, wow. Huh. Like a, yeah, like a claw. Really cool. Yeah. Thing has to have some really strong jet propulsion then. Wow. Persistence. <laughs> So Leila, how did we pick this dive site on this seamount? Yeah, we went through it a bit earlier, but um, we knew that we wanted to dive on this seamount. It had had been sort of pre-selected as a higher priority dive site. And, um, and then we had to look at, we'll first consider what forces the ship would be battling, because although we maybe don't always, viewers don't always think about uh, it when you're watching Hercules fly around, uh, Hercules and Atalanta are still attached to the ship, and and we, the way that we move along the seafloor on a larger scale is by moving the ship and then and essentially towing the vehicles uh, with the ship. And so we have to consider uh, how the ship is capable of moving based on the surface forces that it's experiencing, and so uh, on in this area are the the current and winds that we've been dealing with are coming mostly out of the northeast, um, east-northeast, and so we need to pick dive tracks that are also heading into that general direction um, just for the safest and most optimal travel. Um, and so we then, out of, out of our sort of northeast-facing options, picked the one that looked like it might have the most interesting um, features or s uh, a bit of slope to it, since that's where we've been seeing uh, or, or where we expect to find higher density communities. And we also uh, chose a depth that we thought we could safely handle, um, again, based on you know the, the wave action on the surface and the influence that has on our, on our cable that atta is attached to the ROVs, but also um, pick that depth based on where we've been seeing some of the highest density communities, which is sort of between this like 2,000 and uh, 1,400 meter, 1,300 meter depth. So on this dive, we're landing around 2,200 and expecting to go up to around 16. So we'll see what we find. And, and we have kind of not selected rigid waypoints on this dive. So we're gonna, with the general trend upward, follow whatever aspects of the feature seem to be most most interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep, and one of the ways that we uh, uh, plan our dives is also based off the equipment we have on board. 
So on this dive, we, I believe we have the laser dive we bot do not. attached. Yeah. No, no do dive we? bot. Nope, we can't go deeper than 1500 with the dive bot. So Fair enough. We did yeah. have to consider, that was something that we had to consider in dive planning too, is would it, is it um, worth it, you know, to go a bit deeper, but have to take the dive bot off. And, and on this feature, it seemed like most of what would have been interesting to survey was a bit, um, a bit deeper than the dive bot uh, is rated to. So we decided to take it off and uh, we'll, it'll be back on future dives. But yes, definitely a thing that we need to consider. Yep. I think one of the awesome things about the way they designed that tool is that it's really easy to integrate and, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, deintegrate. Only part of the bottle need to come off and it's a really quick swap probably takes 15 20 minutes on the deck and having, having been out here with a lot of different test technology that's a really really great feature to be able to let us be opportunistic and pick dives without it taking days hours yeah. and hours to days to take equipment on and off the RV. slow to like 20 meters per minute all right 80 meters off bottom so close Mind the sonar too. It's starting to get targets coming in. Keep an eye on it. Starting to be able to see the wall even in Atalanta or the the slope C4. Hmm. Don't know that it's going to be a wall. <laughs> not, not that steep. That'd be nice. Not like the no, not we like we saw last time, which time. was really cool. Those were wild. And then they continued along that for most of the rest of the dive. I was looking at the other pictures. It was. Was a cool feature yeah yeah i still can't believe those like really right angles yeah that is wild predictions do you think we're gonna land on sand or rock Mm, cobbly, sandy, a small, mixture. rocky. Yeah. What do you think? I'm gonna go sand. Okay. I think really, I think really small pebbles. Small pebbles. Okay. I'm going with sand too. We'll like transition into cobbles pretty soon that's <laughs> what I'm hoping so on this dive we are using Atalanta which is our other RV but we also have a similar one called Argus Stop there. Yeah, I'll stop there in the winch. Um, what direction are we going to go in first? Um, roughly n northeast. So like uh, 60. Okay. Yeah, are there, do we have from the bridge right now any cannots? Um, we... The current looks pretty high, but we should be able to go straight ahead. Yeah. Okay. So if we wanted yeah. to go... the bridge says straight ahead is great. So we can also go like... Yeah. Like m maybe more than 50s. <laughs> yeah, do you want... Do 50. 50? Yeah. Why not? Uh, oh, 50 degrees. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if it works for the, anything works for us, whatever you want for that. Um. We can start with that and see what it looks like on bottom when we get there. Kind of see it now. The auto heading on Atlanta. Oh. Guess what it is. Man. Rocky. Rocky <laughs> mixed with Sandy. I got it. Oh, wait. Kind of looks like there's like it. a boundary thing happening. Mm -hmm, I see that. Roger. Can we have the best of both worlds?
really like this dive plan, but we're just going to go explore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a good one. Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look, a fish. Oh. Oh, yeah. Looks like a mercurid. Mm -hmm. Maybe Corypheinoides. Uh, we're moving. So would I go ahead and log on bottom or? Uh, yes, you can log on bottom. Interesting. Looks so steep and yet so standy, sandy. Yeah. Wow. Once again, I had to remind myself that the camera's not tilted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of trippy sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. You know, our friend's asking about Argus. I know we've been getting a ton of questions and comments about Argus. Argus is here. Argus is fine. Um, but we're diving Atalanta instead, in large part because of the forces on um, wire tension, because Argus is bigger and heavier. Um, it puts more strain on the cable, and when the weather is up, when it's really bouncy, those that up and down motion of the ship puts more strain on the cable as well. Oh, and that's still crumbling. So it means our weather window, if we dive with Argus, is smaller. Oh, that's shutter um, speed way And we have a better and faster. chance of uh, getting in the water when we use Atalanta. Oops, every time. Go dark first. Sure. Yeah, it looks like there is a chance. This the screen's not always accurate. Yeah. Until we get to All bottom. All good? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. No, don't do it yet. You're not getting good hits on it. Yeah. Okay, we're ready up here. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's get rolling. Amber, can you explain why we have to do a light balance every single time when, like, if we're diving to the same depth, would the cameras be able to hold the same white and black balance, or do they not have memory like that? Well, there's a memory, but the conditions vary each dive uh, in terms of particulate in the water, uh, you know, the depth that we're at, like you said, and uh, just to, you know, be consistent with our records, we kind of standardize. Uh, go ahead and come down a few meters on Atalanta. Doing a white balance every time. Otherwise, you'll notice, like, when we first come down, the cast can be, like, a little bit greenish, uh, and now it's more normalized. So I started off the ship at point two okay. knots. Let me know if you want to go okay. through this a little faster good. later. Much sediment. Yep, so far. But also rocks. 
So <laughs> cinnamon and rocks. Whoever guessed cinnamon and rocks is <laughs> they they won won it. It. I'm not going to say that I told you so. <laughs> yeah. I forgot we were going up the sea mount. Okay, okay. Well, technically, sand is That's good. tiny rocks. So. Well, they're big rocks <laughs> under <laughs> sediment. <laughs> it's so pretty sand. Mean. As we move on to that ridgy bit, it looks quite flat. I wonder if it's almost more interesting to stay on the side. Yeah. Although there's nothing here either. No. Oh, there's a fish. We'll check it out. Oh, yeah. Oh, no tiny fish. fish. It's standing remarkably still. Yeah. Is it a fish? I mean, I'm pretty yeah. sure it's a fish. Down here. Looks lanky. What are y'all looking yeah, at? Yeah, it's a fish. It's moving. Yes, that looks fish like. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, this sand looks so cool. Mm -hmm. Looks like clouds. Uh, go ahead and zoom. Another, whoop, actually, cuskiel. Do you know what cuskiels eat? I don't know what cuskiels eat. Well, let's, let's find out. I imagine small invertebrates of some kind, but... Hmm. All right, go wide. Thanks. Preying on invertebrates, crustaceans, and other small bottom-dwelling fishes. Hmm. Makes sense. Whoever they can catch, it sounds like. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come down Ooh. another bit on Atalanto. Try and get closer to that 20 meter ring. I think just near the top there was one of those jellies again. It just flew out. Wait, one of the jellies? The jellies. <gasps> what? what? No way. It, what? It's top and to the right. No, like we'll try and get down closer. Like In in Herc? No way. In Herc. It's gone now, but it, it was near the top. What? what? I don't believe you. <laughs> I mean, it was far away, but it was some kind of kind of yeah, yeah, propulsion, yeah, yeah. <laughs> complete with sound effects. Huh. Well, we can only hope it comes back. Ooh, oh, what are you? Yeah, okay. what? Are you? A little what? squid? I don't oh, know. It was very strange, long trailing tentacles. Yeah, very more strange, like one indeed. of those shrimp. Yeah. I've never seen a shrimp with those types of. Was it protrusions? Booty though? backing up? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. The jelly? I don't believe you. Not still. the the, oh. but a jelly. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I oh, like okay. the jelly. <laughs> oh, it's just a random jelly. <laughs> but it was darker in color, too. Huh, okay. Yeah. Still very cool. Yeah. Hopefully it comes back. Oh yeah, what was Megan the something about the coloration of the uh, the hydra medusa we saw oh. indicated that it was yeah. preying on something specific Some maybe sort of, because yeah. of the pigments? Right. Yeah, that, yeah, that was an estimation. So other um, other species in the genus Bathychorus aren't that same color, and so it thought that that dark brown color on the Bathychorus um, probably pretty good there. May then. indicate that it's yeah. uh, feeding on bioluminescent animals oh, right, by yeah. being that kind of mottled red brown. Yeah. Um, very few of those wavelengths traveling through the water. Mm -hmm. Yep. So basically invisible. That's what I think every time we zoom in on a coral and you see the polyps, you're like, this is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the plankton, you know, and that thing being dark brown and super camouflage, you're like, that is a 
what you know other jellyfish nightmares are made of. <laughs> I remember there was some um, experiment that I saw on Nile's website where it took different uh, Ooh, tubes there? that were different colors and uh, mm -hmm. took them down the ocean and showed a color change with yeah. the deep ocean. Is that pretty much similar to what's going on? Yeah, we kind of mess up that effect by bringing our like bright yeah. stadium lights with us, but that's totally the same concept, that the red wavelengths disappear first. Um, people who scuba dive or even if you like dove down to the bottom of a swimming pool or into a lake, you can start to see that, that the colors kind of get mottled and faded. You lose the reds first, then the orange, until everything's kind of a just a dull gray. Um, but it's also the hypothesis of why a lot of deep sea creatures are red is because those red wavelengths never reach them. So uh, if you only reflect red light, you're basically invisible if you're in a place where there's very little red light. Hmm, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. Thanks, Megan. You're welcome. Also, for anyone who's wondering, Megan is not normally on our watch, <laughs> but she's coming in to help today. I'm just lurking. Just <laughs> having fun. I'm actually working on the, the photo highlights, so. Sitting just having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be part of the fun. Yep. So some of you may be watching the feed and see these uh, two green dots floating around. And you're wondering, what's that? Those are actually two lasers coming off of uh, Hercules here, and they help us measure uh, different objects we see. And they're about 10 centimeters apart, I believe. And yep. yeah, they give us a good scale while we're looking at uh, things up close or from afar. Mike, how often do you have to calibrate scaling lasers? All right, yeah, start coming up a bit. Oh, was that for, for, for Michael? Yeah. What's that? How often do you have to calibrate scaling lasers, Mike? I can barely hear you, but calibrate the lasers? Mm -hmm. Do you have to? Do you have to calibrate the lasers? Uh, no, not generally. Um, they, but when they do, if they do fall out of alignment, we just basically see that they're 10 centimeters apart, like, you know, right in front of the lasers, and then we stand back further. We might put Herc out outside, and then we'll put a target in as far away as we can on the inside of the hangar. So once they're fully aligned, you should get 10 centimeters, re you know, regardless of how far away you are at it. So that's the only real calibration. Hmm. And we're finally Shame. on the move here. Woohoo! Atlanta's starting to go. Oh, s we were waiting on uh, on the swing. Yep. Got it. Is the ship still moving, Cheyenne? Yep. Okay. It's, great. it's been moving. It's gone about 50 meters. It's just, we're pretty deep. So yeah, yeah. Atlanta's being a little slow. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so got to make it go faster. I know, I'm looking at that weird rock, too. I know. Uh, <laughs> is it a wheel, though? <laughs> <laughs> it's too <laughs> light. Yeah. No, I was like, sea cucumber? No. Sediment. Whale shark? No. <laughs> it's just rock. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes we find uh, whale bones down here as well. So uh, some are... Uh, um, Cheyenne, I think if we could start heading... If it's possible to start heading sort of up this feature, I can't see myself what that angle would be exactly, but... This is about 90 degrees. Uh, not not that, sorry. Um, the feature that the ship is currently on, the ridge of ish. Uh, oh. It should be that still like that 30. 50. No, really? Yeah. Would you mind indicating it for me with your... Like that? Uh, yeah, I guess... We can head a little further in that direction first before turning up. Do you want to go like this way? I was thinking we could kind of cut cut the on the slope up towards you know that. I wish I could indicate this better. <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
Could you? So do you want to stay on like this little? Yeah, exactly. Engine? And okay. and to get up, we could just go kind of straight towards that now. Yeah. Um, At a steeper angle, but it doesn't really matter. It we'll, won't take that much more time. Just go go the way you're going. You just keep at it. Keep at it with the 50s. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're seeing a whole lot of nothing so far, <laughs> which is Beautiful. fine. Mm -hmm. Wasn't expecting too much difference. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite deep. Yeah. But it's good to good to confirm, you know. Yep. So mm -hmm. we've been yep. Uh, on sort of a lot of these southwestern-ish flanks of um, of different seamounts and guilds, and so it's good to see, you know, on on another one what these depths look like. Because you never know. Yeah, and these are massive features. I mean, this is a twelve-mile long mountain. Yep. Um, wow. So, you know, thinking about what that would be like hiking, you know, these are big, big features and we just drop, you know, it's like mountain climbing with a flashlight at night, you know, we're just seeing this tiny little glimpse of this area through, I don't know, I think about, I love to hike at home, you know, and you're passing through like meadows and then, you know, maybe like light trees and then mm -hmm. heavy forest, it just depends where you're at and we're just seeing one tiny sliver of like the kind of communities that are on this big feature. Yeah, and that's part of the challenge is deciding, do we want to see more slivers on a single feature? Mm -hmm. Do we want to go to more features and see like similar sides, slivers of similar sides and try and compare those? So there's a, a lot of trying to make the most out of the limited time that you have on such big features. Yeah, and there's also the bias of, you know, what we're looking for. like. There is likely tons of life, but they're more sediment dominated species here mm -hmm. and we're flying right over those. Um, but if you were a different researcher or, you know, if someone takes a look at this footage after we've seen it and this is exactly, this inspires questions that they want to answer, you know, this would be the kind of thing that would bring someone back here to, with a different tool um, or a different focus and research the in fauna, maybe the little, yeah. little itty bitties living here. Yeah. If Michael is. Yeah, we are okay with that. Yeah. Still want to know what those little detritus piles <laughs> were. I know. Oh. So curious, but likely some sort of in fauna that we weren't able to see. Something beneath the substrate? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what in fauna means. Yep. Where's. <laughs> well then. <laughs> There's also probably small stuff that we're not seeing. Sometimes oh, we yeah. get close up to something and in still cam from a lower angle and closer in, you can see all this other stuff that you can't even see in the Herc Zeus camera. So many stock so tunicates. So many little things. What are stock tunicates? So, I mean, they're just tunicates on a stock. But tunicates are a type of chordate, but they're like a more basal form, I think, mm -hmm. because they they initially have, so they're not vertebrates, but in their fetal, not f fetal, I don't know, in their mm -hmm. development, in their early stages, they have a notochord, which is basically mm -hmm. their like central nervous system. And that's what classifies them into chordates. They have like a central, like a, yeah, yeah, like the notochord is like the basal, um, like the pre-vertebrate, but mm -hmm. they, they develop and they don't have it anymore, but yeah, that's basically it. But they, if you didn't know that, they basically just look like jelly things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like um, that pink thing I was describing on the previous watch, the sea pork, that's actually a tunicate too. Yeah, mm -hmm. sea squirts, you might see. 
in uh, yeah, they're the closest southeastern thing related US. thing to us that we yeah. see down here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's kind of amazing. That's interesting. They're fun. But yeah, I would assume that they're on a stalk for extra elevation. A lot of them, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we see that same life plan from so many things down here that are, yeah. there's something called the bound, bottom boundary layer at the bottom of the ocean, mm -hmm. which is where the water slows down literally just by friction of running into all these rocks and bumps. Um, you know, the water moves slower if it's got more stuff to climb over on the way versus water that's a little bit above, mm -hmm. you know, and there's different bottom boundary layers. There can be, you know, centimeter scale, one meter scale. But if you can get up out of that turbulent, slow moving water, and if you make a living by catching food as it drifts by on the currents, you, you'd rather be up where there's more current drifting. And so I was, you know, we see it in, in tunicates, and crinoids and coral yeah. colonies and invertebrates living on top of coral colonies and crinoids Even and fish. tunicates. Yeah, to try and, try and make the most of it. Like the tripod fish, they kind of yeah. perch themselves in the sediment up. Mm -hmm. So they're a bit taller. Yeah. Oh, can we look at this? Sorry, just noticing that we're seeing things. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and zoom in. Looks like some sort of glass sponge. Mm -hmm. The base of a broken oh, something. A dead one. Oh, one of those spiky ones. Yeah, it like looks not oh, as... Uh, like Walteria usually looks more... Um, I don't know how to s sparse like yeah there's almost over less of a wall but this but maybe that's what that is and if there's just a lot of sediment over it maybe yeah and then I think there's oh that's a boulder never mind okay I think we're good that's good thank you thank you it's not just hey, okay. oh what oh and then I think I see some sea whips right behind it. But I don't know if they're visible. They probably won't be visible enough on camera. But I'm just looking in the still cam. Yeah, they're gone. Maybe ISO down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Definitely. pretty well focused though. A little thing. Oh yeah. There is what I was referring Tiny to. Tiny little branching things little one so there is little stuff there's little corals oh, there's a little living sponge there I think oh yeah if we could look at that oh, yeah. quick <clears throat> go ahead and zoom Some kind of you put tell it maybe. Uh, gonna yeah. yeah. See that lobster? Yep. Is that squat lobster in the back? Uh, is that a crab of some kind? I can't quite see. I, I want to be inclined to say it's a crab. I don't know what kind of you put tell it this is, sure. but I want to say it's what it is. That looks like a squat lobster behind yeah. almost. Oh, actually, yeah, because it's more circular in shape, or like spherical. Could we zoom on the squat lobster a bit more, or is that full <laughs> zoom there? Ooh. That's my full right now. I don't know cool. if it's a chirostylid. Look at all the projections okay. coming off of the uh, bottom of that rock. That's good there. Thank you, Mike. Hey, full wide. Yeah, it looks like this one. Is it chirostylid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It was one of those, but spinier arms. I'm just put Kyra silent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Woohoo! Getting somewhere. Yeah, I also can't believe we came across that king crab eating a fish. That was oh, really that cool. Was a too, is yeah. that a fallen stock? I think it is. Just That's a big one. Are we good to keep moving the ship, or do you want to wait till Adelante gets above? No, you can keep going. Well. Okay. And I still wonder what that big fish was that we didn't quite get to see. Hmm. Next to it. <coughs> Where? When the crab was eating the fish, oh, there was like yeah. a fish to the side. But right. Oh, maybe can we look at this if you're able? Yep. And then I think Thanks. there's a whip of some kind above that. Yeah. This is something dead, but. Go ahead and zoom. Oh yeah, a lot of things in the background. Hmm. Hard to tell what that's a dead sponge, yeah. what kind of sponge that is. It's really dead. That's all right. All right, more good. Thank you. Oh, it should be. Yeah, full wide. I'm gonna be a Shoot. quick look at the at whatever whip was sticking up behind that. Bless you. Uh, a ways up. Straight up from here? Uh, yep, straight up from here. Maybe a little to the right. Oh, okay, there, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's a an old stock of something or a whip. It looks fairly hard. Is there a current yeah. here? It looks like it's waving a lot. Go ahead and zoom. Not much current right no. now. There, actually, I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's just the angle. Yeah. Huh. So we got some questions coming in from our uh, website. So, does Nautilus only drive in the Pacific? That's a good question. So, our main research area so far has been the Pacific Ocean, but we have sailed all around the world as well. Nautilus has been down the Gulf of Mexico, as well as parts of the Atlantic Ocean, and even the Great Lakes. So, we do many different missions, investigating the biology, geology, and archaeology of the ocean. Yeah, it's actually only really the last few years that Nautilus has worked in the Pacific. Before that, it was the Med, Atlantic, Gulf, through the Panama Canal, west coast of the U.S., and here, slowly more and more in the Pacific. And we'll be here next year as well. Woohoo! Yeah, OET is headquartered in... Hawaii, is that correct? Uh, or no? URI, I guess, is, or yeah, in Rhode Island. Okay, okay. Um, but uh, one of the main members of our team lives in Hawaii, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the boat's dock uh, in the off season is currently Honolulu. Mm. But before that, when we were doing our West Coast work, it was in San Pedro, California. Mm. Any other questions? Yep. So, uh, great question. Are we on the ship? Uh, that's a <laughs> solid yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you uh, kind of want an indicator of that, uh, you can you look closely, and if we hit a big wave, you can kind of see us just rotating in our seats without touching anything. It's kind of <laughs> fun. It's like a big roller coaster. Yep. But really slow. Mm -hmm. Not that exciting. <laughs> I don't know. Being on the top deck, 
Yeah. When it's really mm. lots of big swells out is pretty fun. Yeah, it could be really fun just to ride the waves. <laughs> and get the sea spray in your face. It's like an amusement park ride. <laughs> just uh, don't lose your lunch up there. Almost happened to me a few times. All right, another question. Do either of the ROVs have audio recording equipment? And do we ever take sound recordings at the bottom of the sea? Mm. They don't have any on now. I don't know that we've ever attempted it. I've never heard of it. Um, there would be a lot of noise. The vehicles, well, Herc, Herc makes an awful lot of noise. Uh, they both make some noise. So I think it would be difficult to to hear beyond that, maybe. I think well, they yeah, did I've never heard of put a hydrophone on it once. Did we? I think hmm. so. Uh, I want to say that was on the west coast somewhere. Uh, you know, like one one of the Cascadia margin cruises. I wasn't on for this, but uh, I, I did a little like a story map of the papers that were published out of the many cruises we did on the Cascadia margin. And one of them had this hydrophone data in it. Yeah, I guess you could get something out of it if you filtered out all the the herc noise. Yeah, I don't recall exactly what they found. But yeah, they're quite noisy. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, it's hard to think. You don't realize that. We're looking at the screen. It's like nice mm. and peaceful and quiet, but it's not really like that. I have a GoPro on a little ROV operate in a home in Labrador. And... Uh, the first time I used the GoPro, I was just like jarred out of my seat. I was just playing the video and it's just recording all the audio. It's just quite loud thruster noise. Oh, okay. Yeah, they deployed a hydrophone uh, and it was like, it was listening to the bubble action actually at the seeps. Oh, oh. that's fun. Mm -hmm. So did they have the hydrophone just while Herc was diving, or did they like leave it? Uh, I think it was seeps. mounted on Herc, or they brought it down on Herc. They didn't leave it there; they brought it back up. But did they? Was it did like a remote away thing? Did they leave it know. there they and go might, away? They might have left it and gone away. I don't know. It doesn't yeah. say. Might have left it, gone, done other stuff on the dive, and come back for it. Yeah. Have you all ever heard of um, the blip? It was like this very loud sound recorded somewhere in the ocean, I'm not sure where. But uh, for the longest time, people didn't have any explanation for it, whether it's some unknown deep sea creature or like a underwater landslide. But hmm. still speculating on it. It's kind of like the wow signal of the ocean. So, another question we have coming in. How are you connected to the internet in the middle of the ocean? Uh, that's another excellent question. So, we are able to communicate to you live via technology called telepresence. So, uh, you can see on our cameras, and we just had a big uh, Siphon 4 colony show up, I believe. And our two cameras are Hercules and Atalanta. They are both connected via a tether, and they can send in a live of a live video feed via fiber optic cable within that tether. That information then gets sent up to our ship and then our computers on board and our video engineers are able to help sequence that uh, video and send it via our uh, satellite antenna on our ship. If you ever get a chance to look at Nautilus, you'll see something that looks like a golf ball and a tee and that's our satellite antenna. Those go up to satellites orbiting above Earth. They are in geostationary orbit meaning they stay in one spot and they're able to connect people different spots of the world. And that beams back down to our substation in Rhode Island. That's the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island in Narragansett. And then that video feed once again gets beamed out live to the internet. And it's at near instantaneous speed. I believe it's by three second delay. So you're all able to reach out to us out here in the ocean pretty much live because of that. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yep. you. Awesome. 
I'm lurking in the studio, but happy to join you all for some blue water. <laughs> so Daniel, do we have unlimited internet out here? Ah, uh, that's a great question. I say great question a lot, but they're all good questions. <laughs> so uh, our internet actually is limited because we are having to connect to satellites that aren't always directly above us because we drift out of the way. S and also we can't stream on our ship because there's such a small bandwidth. So that means no Netflix, no Disney Plus, no YouTube. Anything you want to watch has to be downloaded. And that's totally fine. Honestly, even with internet access out here, it's nice to, you know, unplug and unwind. Well, we got a shout out for you, Liga, in the chat. Somebody said, hey. For who? Uh, you. For You're me. saying hi. Hi. All right. So what's the most interesting thing besides the jelly that we've seen so far on our, on our watch, I would say? What, what do you all think? Like all of our watches or like this particular watch? This particular watch, our 12 to 4 watch. I had to say, for me personally, <laughs> was all the uh, oceanic white tips that swim around the boat when we're doing our dives. That was really cool to see. Just uh, a shark outside of its tank. I'm used to seeing them in tanks and <laughs> aquariums. I think those are my favorite, too. Um, I know you said beside the jelly, but... That was so cool. Um, that little crab we saw the other day, too. Oh, oh yeah, the oh crab yeah. and crab. I forgot about that crab. That was really I love cool. those. There's so many of them around uh, around methane seeps. Yep. The Yeti crabs. Oh, yeah, the Yeti, Yeti crabs, too, right? Oh, they're so that cute. Actually end up consuming that chemosynthetically derived carbon. Yeah. Pretty cool. What was the nice. question? What your favorite thing you've seen is? Ah, uh, the sea dandelion, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not yeah. even worth asking me that question. Of course. I think seeing all, like, <laughs> the different, like, the sharks at the bottom. The sharks were cool yesterday. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. We got a lot of those, yeah. yeah. I also really enjoy the big, hard coral we found, that big madrepora. That was really cool because I've... Like, I've only really seen that in, like, sequencing. Mm. So, like, seeing it for real, I was like, what? <laughs> it's cool to just talk about cool stuff you saw when I wasn't here. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. You could go watch it on Nautilus Live, Leva. That's, That's true. where the highlights are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll use all the ship bandwidth. Watch you. <laughs> <laughs> I might, you know, know how to hook you up with the <laughs> Um, and Megan, I don't know if you're doing okay. anything, but I think today's a special day in terms of some sort of public comment. It sure is a special day. Yeah. Nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that or... <laughs> sure, happy to. Um, today is the last day to submit public comment on a public proposal for this region and more regions of the Pacific Remote Islands. They've been nominated to become a National Marine Sanctuary. Um, that includes the areas that are currently inside the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, but also everywhere that we've been on this expedition. So expanding out into the waters all the way to the 200 nautical mile extent of the U.S. exclusive economic zone, which means encompassing all the waters that are managed and controlled by the U.S. here in the Pacific Remote Islands. So this is a proposal from NOAA, um, was nominated by a group called the uh, Pacific Remote Islands Coalition and um, put forward by NOAA into this multi-step process where uh, they'll come up with a nomination, accept public comment, um, develop a 
a sanctuary plan, which would actually say like what, you know, based on that feedback, what are the boundaries? What are some of the proposed regulations of what would be allowed and not allowed? And, you know, how, how basically will management help address the questions and concerns and challenges of this area? And then there'll be another public comment. So it's a really great chance, you know, this is conservation and democracy and, you know, all these things in action that people can get involved in um, whatever your opinions are or your, make your voice heard about how to do this. And one of the best ways to find that out, if you're watching on YouTube, come on over to nautiluslive.org. If you're watching on nautiluslive.org, go ahead and click the gallery tab. And there's a blog there that says, submit your comments about the proposed National Marine Sanctuary. It gives you tons more info, maps of the proposed areas and uh, a link to submit your comments. And comments are due today. So this is your short-term homework, maybe while we're descending right here on blue water. Um, click on over to those links and, and get your comment in before tomorrow, June 2nd. Woohoo! Thank you, Megan. You're welcome. Casual PSA. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of blue water, we have about 45 minutes left. Only 45 minutes? Not bad. Only. Yeah. Yeah. Crushing it. <laughs> I think it's time for a joke. Mm. Someone in the chat put in a pretty neat joke earlier. I just had to pull it up real quick. Okay. I'm in the market to buy my first boat. I sure hope I can find one on sale. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> A nice sailboat on sale. So I have a question for you, Cheyenne. 